to session two, um, a day in the life, material barriers and other experiences in the profession. Uh, my name is Pete Sparks. I'm a man in my 40s with longish, scruffy, dark hair and a rapidly greying beard. I'm wearing a large pair of headphones. Um, I'm artistic director of Drake Music Scotland and was honoured to work closely with Ben Lunn and many others to put together Diversions, which is the concert performance that we'll be sharing at lunchtime today. Um, this session is called A Day in the Life, Material Barriers and Other Experiences in the Profession. And for this session, we're going to hear from two of today's featured composers, Joe Stollery and Ryland Gleave. Uh, I won't give you a long introduction, as I'm sure we just want to hear as much from them as possible, but I will post in the chats uh, each of their websites, so you can maybe go and have a look and see some of their other work and find out a bit more about them. So I'll post Joe's first, because I'm going to speak to Joe first. Uh, there we go, that should come up. Um, in planning this session, we decided to eat, ask each composer to prepare some responses to six questions. So here we go. Are you ready, Joe? I hope so. Great. <laughs> so uh, the first question was to open up this conversation. Can you tell us what led you to being a composer or to becoming a composer? What support was there to help you explore this new world? Well, wow. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, um, I mean, where do I start really? I mean, um, I start, I mean, um, I had a real, also sci-fi blank out a lot, but, um, well, not sure, but, but yeah, um, yeah, when it comes to composing, I mean, I've always had a real passion for, um, music from a very young age. I mean, there's, I think my awesome, maybe, and no doubt my awesome probably maybe made, um, the music thinking a lot more dramatically and I often engaged quite a lot. In fact, mum, I think I remember my parents actually, our family videos of me actually, um, when they watch like a Disney film and um, I'm, I'm often there looking very, very sort of tense and dramatic, tense and tense about the whole thing because it's energy. And even, I mean, there was even some basic ch children's shows as well. I think Pingu is one that um, I like to keep remembering a few times that the music can, <laughs> music in there, even though it's simple as it is actually, I found it very dramatic at the time. And even now I still engage in, I think this might be, um, this, these passions might have been um, an engagement, might have helped me to actually choose my, decide to actually take up music and take up creating music. Cause I mean, even, and we had a piano in the house as well. And I'd often improvise and even though it was probably Absolute, ca absolute calamity to um, well, for the rest of my family. I, I just think I just enjoyed it because I just loved the sounds of it so much. And yeah, when it came to support, ooh, um, yeah, I mean, I, I love, I mean, I had a lot of, had some really good support from my childhood. I mean, from my parents, from my schools. Um, I just, I kind of felt very lucky, I think. I suppose it probably helped that my dad is also chair of a, a big new music sort of new music sort of festival but yeah <laughs> great yes so i think the, the you you mentioned as well yeah the the fact that there's a there's an existing network in the northeast of composers and people really interested in putting on new music is is always helpful for composers um yeah. the sec second question we had was um during your early studies were there any big problems <laughs> That either slowed you down or caused uh, a struggle for you. Well, um, one thing that did um, come up, I think, in my undergraduate studies in particular, was um, did you know the, um, the conversation was actually getting people together to actually to actually record the pieces I composed. Like I think in the comp composition module, I think um, they didn't make it compulsory, but they did um, like expect, they had it on the thing that I expected you to have, prepare a record, some sort of recording of like every piece submitted. And I mean, recording it um, wasn't really the main challenge. I mean, I mean, I just a little bit of technology and of, I mean, had some like good support in 
like some tech savvy people to help with that. But the real challenge was actually calling on my fellows to um, help help perform the pieces basically. And um, yeah, cause I mean, they kind of just expect you to have some social skills, which I lacked quite considerably at the time. Like, and I think, I mean, I'm getting better at the communication skills, but I still, even now, I still find it a big struggle. Like, I'm just not, I'm just by nature, I'm just not that assertive, really. I mean, I often wait for the person to come to me first before I come to them, usually, by default. Yeah, I I think that that, that is something that, that we've sort of covered and talked about. I think it's quite a common feeling that for a lot of composers, they find the composing actually is the easier part it's yeah. the it's the, the getting together with lots of people and actually promoting yourself and yeah. getting your voice heard and and that kind of thing is it can be more of a challenge um brilliant that's really clear um question number three uh, what has been most enjoyable about entering the professional world of music so that's a nice positive question yeah well i think um it's well, basically things like this, really. I mean, it's, it's well, specifically, it's more like um, getting the opportunity to actually um, get to know what my fellow peers are doing around. Because, I mean, there's some really crazy fit, fun things going on. I mean, not just in Sound Festival, but also at the proms. I mean, I've been listening to a new music show recently on Radio Free. And, yeah, I will admit quite a lot of the pieces are in quite a, a wild um, aspect of that's quite out out of the way from what, what my usually comfort zone is, but it's always good to learn these new things. And they've got some really good things to use for, even when, I mean, even when it gets very, um, the music can be quite challenging to listen to on that kind of thing. I mean, often, I'm often fascinated by the stories behind them and how they how they actually put together. And it sort of helps me, helps me to actually develop my voice as a composer to see where can I go? Maybe it's, they're not giving necessarily directions, but maybe they're more sort of helping like see some people are doing that. I mean, you want to try something like that or maybe sometimes engage with it or sometimes react against it. I mean, you know what I mean? Just, yeah, ab- just lots of fun things going on. Absolutely. And I think your your um, point about being able to share your work with other people means you will listen to their work as well. And being part of uh, sort of groups of composers presenting works means you can learn um, new ideas that you may have not not thought about. And I, I like the very gentle way you've put about, you've, you've said about um, your different aesthetics, perhaps from other <laughs> composers. Sometimes you don't like what you hear, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but, but that's also also completely fine. Yeah, it's all about. I mean, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so that was- Attached like the romantic sort of style. Yeah, yeah. We need all kinds of different styles of music. I think that's, that's what's really important. Yeah. Um, okay, next one is uh, what has been least enjoyable or even difficult, upsetting about entering the professional world of music? Yeah, this is an easy one. And it's a thing that I think um, Ben might have mentioned a few times, I think, when we were at the first neurodivergent courses. And it's basically the fact that sometimes I have to compete to um, get my music um, showcased. Like, you know, these, all these competitions. I mean, I don't mind the ideas of competition, competitions and I know they can be, um, sometimes they're needed to like, because sometimes you can't go for everybody else. But the fact of the matter is it's, I just I just find it um, having to actually fight over something just goes against my creed, which basically, I mean, I want, to, I want to get on with everybody, really. I want to put on a good impression for everybody. And it's just the fact that I have to actually then fight for something it just goes against it somehow i mean i want to be i just want to be friends with everybody and this is just a difficult circle to square really at times even though i know it's a necessary one but sometimes but i mean it, it can be difficult for me to um, i mean it can be difficult for me to um compete to, to, to lose a competition but sometimes i actually find it difficult to actually um even when i win a competition and i think about who else is who else has gone and who are going to be disappointed as much as I am. Yeah. Just, yeah. I, I, I think that's that the idea of, um, you, you touched on it earlier, that promoting yourself is kind of difficult. But of course, if you are, uh, when your success 
which is very pleasing for you means other people haven't you know got that that success then of course that's that's tinged with awareness of that but um yeah yeah and i think well the the i suppose it's to do with the number of opportunities you have to have your works performed and played means that it is a competitive um process so yeah i'm, I'm sure other people will have have some thoughts about that um i should say as well I, I do plan to leave us a little bit of time at the end for for questions so if you have um specific things you want to ask rylan or joe then um, please do put a question in the chat and i'll try and read it um okay that was uh, that's question four question number five um how much yeah. do you feel connected to the music world uh, either to composers or performers um and i guess organizations and venues yeah well i mean um this is still definitely a work in progress like i still feel there's a long way to go but i do feel i've made some good strides recently i mean i've for a start i mean the university of Aberdeen music department i've got very strong connections with i mean i've got to know all the like all my fellow student composers i got to know the staff and yeah i mean the sound festivals helped actually also help with things and of course neurodivergence i mean i mean i got to know ben siobhan Ryan, all those people as well, and that's a new network. So yeah, I do feel certainly like with Compose, I'm getting there. Performers, it might be, um, might still need to, to go for a bit. Because I mean, as far as I can tell, I think the only, I think you, I think it's really mainly um, in, Aber in Aberdeen Union's sound festival right now. But um, I do feel like I am um, getting there. I mean, it can be very, like I said, it's still quite tricky at times. And I mean. Often I do feel a bit nervous around what, for actually engaging with people, actually doing the first engagement, like I mentioned earlier. But um, I mean, I, I mean, it's very good to. Um, I, mean, I would love to be in these kind of networks. It's it's good to see what these people are doing, and yeah. I think um, the, the, yeah, you brought up the the idea of the the neurodivergent meeting. We had a meeting probably a couple of years ago now in Glasgow. Um, where composers could talk about their experiences and have a chat. Um, and it does feel to me that that's been a really positive thing because it's this idea of actually, it's not just me that feels like this, I, I understand. And some people may have had strategies or ideas of how to, how to kind of pursue what they really want to do. But it does feel one of the reasons why we've kind of come together today is it feels like perhaps some performing organizations, venues, festivals, um, maybe there's some ways that they can also provide more support to actually draw composers to, to feel more confident about offering their work and offering kind of ideas for what they want to achieve. And as you said, that can be something that's, that's harder to do because you are, you know, you're promoting yourself. Yeah. Um, and the, the last question is uh, what changes would best help you to develop in the best way for you? So this is quite a good question, really, about what what do you think we should try and change together? Yeah, I mean, I did have um, a good think about this one because this one this question was one of the hardest, I'll admit. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think one thing I has I have been thinking about over um, for a while is um, just about how I'm often quite nervous about actually sometimes revealing some of them about some of my ideas because I mean I've got quite an eclectic sort of um, style of um like lots of things are going in from like very crazy ideas and i'm often a bit nervous about revealing them because people think i've gone mad or something like that and i mean i know i probably shouldn't be that worried about it but at the same i just don't know i mean there's something sort of keeping me a bit nervous about it so i guess i think i think the one main thing is just keep the doors open really if you understand what the metaphor i'm trying to get at is but um yeah there's basically um yeah, just keep the opportunities open because I mean, um, it, I do feel that while these things, while these things are quite, um, I mean, I might have some wildly ambitious ambitions out there. I mean, I do kind of feel they can be useful for maybe to, I mean, for I know they could help actually um, forward like the idea, like all the, it can, it can, it can help actually keep music. So I'm trying to find the right, the right kind of um, words here, but basically it helps keep them, um, adds new things pretty much gives new it give, gives yeah basically gives new sort of insights into what music can be i mean basically it's like helping going back to question three again it's like my contributions because i know there are some crazy things going out there and i mean i want to try some crazy things as well 
because I mean, after all, I mean, autism isn't, I mean, it's impossible to be like normal when you're autistic. And if you think about it. There's a, a whole other session we could have about the word normal, I'm sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, that's that's fantastic, Joe. And, and I, I think your idea of keeping the doors open is is really important. I'm very aware that sometimes it's quite um, it's no, it's never easy, but it's it's quite common for there to be opportunities for young composers or student composers to to try something out and to work with an ensemble. What's really difficult is then to repeat that opportunity or to, to kind of have regular chances to have your works played. And it is that kind of regular repeated opportunities that 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 are vital to to help somebody develop from a kind of a promising young student into a fully yeah. fledged composer who has something really important to say and and, and says it to, to as many people as possible i think that's um that's really yeah. clear and so if is there anything else you would like to add um ooh, um I mean, I guess I mean, if you want some, <laughs> I mean, if you get just you want like a good showcase, I mean, obviously the Skin Obsession is going to get performed yes. later on. I mean, that's a piece I kind of wrote. I think, yeah, I mean, it, it deals with obsession as well, which is as you can probably tell. But it's based on like um, I mean, I, for a start, it's based on a Scottish myth. I do love myths and legends. But also, it also because it deals with like basically a Kaylee, which is basically it's forced to repeat and again and again and again the same sort of melody. I mean, I sort of there's an there's another autistic trait now. It basically shows what demonstrates like obsession. Often I keep the same thing keeps coming back and again and again. And sometimes it can be benevolent, other times it can drive me insane. At times. And that that is that will yeah. be part of the performance at lunchtime. And I think I believe that there'll be a chance for people to. To let you know how that how that worked for them because yeah. there will be a, a, a chance for people to share their thoughts with you thank yeah. you very so much like joe thing. that's fantastic um and i've posted yeah, a link a to your, your website uh, in the chat yeah, and so i will thanks turn you. to rylan and again rylan i will post a link to your website and please do visit that um website uh, rylan was was supporting um, the very start of the conference uh, with signed interpretation, BSL interpretation. And I think I first met Rylan in that guise as a composer, but also somebody who's very interested in interpreting and, and all kinds of different ways of, of getting the message across. Um, so just moving on, I've got the same questions basically. So uh, I'll just fire away. Um, can you tell us what led you to becoming a composer? And what support was there to help you explore that new world? Yeah, so my entry to the composition discipline started at an undergraduate degree level. Um, I trained as a singer previously, and this actually links in beautifully to Eleanor's comment in the chat a little while ago, um, speaking about um, gender and autism. Um, and as a trans autistic composer, um, it was very difficult for me to uh, articulate my ideas earlier. And I think that degree of intersectionality is really important when we're talking about autism. Um, so people who are further discriminated against because of gender, because of sexuality, because of race, class. Um, so yeah, those additional barriers, I think are really important to bring up. And thank you, Eleanor, for, for putting that in the chat. Um, so yeah, I was a little late to the composition party, um, but I attended the RCS Composition Summer School um, with plans to study as a singer at the Welsh Conservatoire. But um, Gordon McPherson, who was head of the composition department at that time, asked me to switch disciplines about two weeks before term started. <laughs> that was when I met Siobhan as well. Um, so it was a very last minute decision and a, a huge scramble to suddenly switch disciplines. Um, I felt at that stage some support would have really been useful. Um, I didn't have a good knowledge of music theory or contemporary repertoire. And I did feel really out of my depth for about two years. Um, in terms of other support, I was open about being autistic and about struggling with mental health. Um, and I was offered a learning agreement from the RCS's disability officer, which I initially declined just because it didn't feel relevant. Um, other than disclosing my disabilities to relevant staff members, uh, I didn't really know what else they could do to support me. Great, thank you. That's very clear. Um, 
And next question is, during your early studies, so this may be following on from that, really, um, were there any big problems that either slowed you down or caused a struggle? And you've obviously mentioned some of the, maybe the technical stuff you needed to, to catch up with, but any other things you'd like to talk about? Yeah, so similarly to Joe, um, a lot of the conservatoire model, and I suppose the university model, expects you to be able to make your own friends and have them play your music. And I really struggled with that um, because that relies on me taking the lead in that conversation and that role and actively seeking performers to A, be friends with and B, convinced to play your music, um, which is, is quite a struggle. Um, I also found group classes and the seemingly ever-changing schedule really difficult. Um, I'd come from music school with really rigidly structured lessons and breaks and then frantic last minute room changes, lecture changes, huge stretches of time with no structure. Um, unlike a university, there weren't many societies that I could join. Um, so I was really lucky that the deaf actors on the BA performance course adopted me, took me under their wing, um, which meant that I could make friends with not a group of musicians, but a group of actors, uh, learn a lot about theatre, learn BSL. Um, but that did mean I ended up more isolated from the musicians um, and still playing catch up to how the music world worked. And I think um, I remember talking to you about this before and, and you brought up a really interesting point about different ways of communicating and that actually sometimes for you signing felt uh, like a, a slower, maybe more measured way of getting your thoughts across, whereas using verbal communication was sometimes more challenging. Absolutely. Um, I still, given the chance, prefer to use sign language. Um, it cuts out so much of the filler in English that I struggle with, that kind of social chit chat that's very, very British, I suppose. Um, I don't understand most of that. I don't understand why it is involved in conversation. I much prefer a very to the point forward. This is how it is. This is what we're talking about. This is what we're doing. Um, so yeah, BSL definitely cuts out a lot of English hedges and filler that you know we're so used to. Great. No, I, th I, th I think it's, it's, I find that really interesting. Um, and nice question. What has been the most enjoyable about entering the professional world of music? Um, and I've, I've enjoyed watching you achieve some, some great commissions recently. And, and so you are, you're doing a, you're doing a great job. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I think there's, there's too many aspects that are enjoyable for me to just pick one. Um, I think collaborating with performers and ensembles who actually want to work with you is fantastic. Um, having someone approach you after having seen a performance or finding your website or pieces online, making it like really explicitly clear that they like what you're doing, they want to work with you, that's a wonderful feeling. Um, it really satisfies the, I've worked hard on this and now it's complete element of composition and that kind of closure, that sense of, oh, I have done something and now I'm hearing it live and it's done. And yeah, that's a really wonderful thing. Um, I also love spending hours on my own, focusing on a piece of music. Um, I find all the stages from research to engraving, which for Karen's benefit is making the score look really pretty and readable. Um, but I, <laughs> this is really quite sad. I love, love, love writing application forms. Um, I think I've only been so <laughs> fortunate with commissions because I just, love writing application forms if you see something online i'm just anything i'm eligible for i'm just constantly on like gotta fill this out <laughs> that's 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 an unusual um love i think yeah <laughs> um and i suppose the the other side of that is um what what what's been the least uh enjoyable about the sort of the professional world of, of music yeah, um, that flip side is that navigating interpersonal relationships of the professional music world is really hard, um, especially starting them. Um, unless somebody else explicitly tells me that they want something or they need something from me, they clarify it in a few different ways. I'm wondering what I've missed in a conversation that has been communicated more subtly. Um, I'm also, like Joe was saying, unsure of how to approach conversations with kind of ensembles or initiatives or organizations. It feels though my student experience has very much been someone has seen your work and kind of likes it and goes, hello, would you like to work with us? But transitioning from emerging artist into kind of more fully fledged composer, it feels like there's maybe more responsibility put on you as an artist to approach people. And I have no frame of reference at all for how to do that. Um, I also really <laughs> I struggle with tone changes in conversation. So, Often I'll send a really formal email 
and I'll get like a really casual email back and I'm like, oh, okay. So I'll send a casual email back and then I'll get a really formal email back and I'm like, oh, <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know what to do regarding this. <laughs> That, that's um i think that's something that would be very interesting to explore further as well the idea of uh in early stages of potential collaboration or, or shall we do this thing and what should it be like and maybe it could happen that there's always quite a lot of things that are moving and things that are maybe not defined and and i understand that can be uh can be very uncomfortable can be very difficult can be really kind of almost upsetting um so I think that's that's a really interesting thing to talk about, and hopefully the promoters and the concert organisers and uh, organisations who are here today will, will think about that as well. The idea of how do you try and be as clear as you can about what the possible options are. Um, how much do you feel connected to the music world, uh, and that's including comp other composers and performers? I think I find it hard to visualise the music world as an entity. Um, there are certain organizations like Sound Festival that I feel quite connected to. Um, Glasgow scene, you know, is, is moving quite forward. There's a lot of movement in the Glasgow scene um, and performers who I'm fortunate to work with regularly. But like the new music scene largely feels really quite confusing. Um, it's maybe something to do with how musicians use social media or how London centric a lot of the UK's music scene is. Um, I've really enjoyed the opportunities like Joe that I've had to meet and work with other autistic musicians. Um, and when organizations take that extra bit of time and care to explain what they're looking for. Right, yeah, I think um, it's come, become clear from, from our conversation, actually, you know, the Northeast and Glasgow, there are, there's, there's some really good, it's become quite important to both of you to have that, that network, but there's always, always more to be done. And that leads me on to the last question. Um, what changes would help you develop uh, in the best way for you. So what may we change that will help you to flourish even further? Yeah, um, this is something that I've seen some organizations start to do, um, which is even just to write explicitly that autistic and other neurodivergent people are encouraged to get in touch or apply. Um, there's that instant relaxation in the knowledge that I can write about my experiences as an autistic person and not be immediately swept into the rejection pile um, or I can share music that engages with neurodiversity without worrying I'll be regarded as controversial. Um, there's been a few opportunities I've applied for and they've been like, this is really weird subject matter to be addressing. And I'm like, well, it's kind of who I am as a musician, like maybe state that you're not looking for personal experiences in that way. Um, again, like really clear and explicit descriptions of what initiatives are looking for is useful to me. Um, and then I'm not having to send tons of follow-up emails, which I'm sure is you know annoying for absolutely everybody. Um, so yeah, just really clear information, um, writing explicitly that if you're wanting to work with neurodivergent people, that that's okay. Even just putting that in text on your website is, is super easy for then us to kind of go, oh, right, that's, that's what you're looking for. It's okay for me to get in touch. That's, that's a really practical thing. And I think there is, um, th there's a session later on today where at that, that point maybe could be further explored the idea of what clarity is needed, but also just welcoming people to say please you know we are thinking about you as well as as somebody that that could could be part of our program um we've just got a few minutes left a couple of minutes left um and i don't want to run over so does anybody have any specific questions i won't be able to see hands up i don't think because i'm just on this but i don't know if anyone has a specific question um if i go back elena to does elena hi um, sorry, I probably won't make sense because I never do in questions. I end up talking about myself, but I promise to ask you the question. Can I just say I was amazed when you said BSL because I, all my life, have wanted to sign language instead. And I grew up abroad um, where they don't recognise that at all. So I just, I think, was mute for about 18 years till university. Where did you learn, this is probably not, but where did you learn it and how can you, so two questions. First kind of where did you learn it and when, how old? And then how do you sort of switch between that, using that and that? Because I did my Drake Music residency in a different Drake Music, the England one. And I try to say so many times, can I use communication cards? But they almost forget each time we had a meeting and I just wondered how you did that sort of switch 
between BSL and that. And it's, it's almost about the consistency of people remembering, because I think that's what I, as an autistic person, find. You say, we can repeat our access needs till we're blue in our face and people it's almost like they're just it's like groundhog day it's like the very next time you have a meeting they've completely forgotten what you've said before and you've done a passport that thick with all your like what would be true you know anyway that's my question yes um to answer the first part of that question i was 18 um i'd just gone to start my undergrad degree um and the a uh, BA performance course started at the Royal Conservatory of Scotland had just started accepting deaf actors. Um, so there was this new community that was starting the same time that I'd arrived and they sort of took me under their wing, looked after me, um, gave me the very basics of teaching and that kind of developed into a more natural conversation. Um, and I then went and took some classes. I jumped into a level three NBQ qualification and then skipped to a level six uh, over the course of about three years. Um, but there's, there's tons of um, Scotland resources, especially for actually getting into BSL and learning it. And I'm sure Karen, who's up there, will be able to help you out with that. Um, it's really, really worthwhile doing. Um, I found for me, it's allowed me to express a lot of what I needed to say uh, in the same way that my music does, um, which is kind of without verbalizing in a lot of ways. Um, in regard to BSL as an access need, um, I didn't really flag that up at university purely because I have a feeling that it would have been a difficult one to navigate. Um, I really did struggle with the disability officer at the conservatoire. Um, I found when I finally went for a learning agreement meeting, she essentially looked at my grades and went, oh, you're getting all A's. Why did you want to come here? And I was like, you've been hassling me to come here to write a learning agreement for like two years. Like, do you have no plan in place? Is there nothing? Um, so it didn't feel like I could actually ask for anything else. Um, other than, you know, getting to know um, interpreters and deaf people, um, I'm not 100% sure what I could recommend in that regard. Um, I've kind of taught the people around me who I interact with daily, the very basics of sign language. So if I am nonverbal because of an overload or just sensory input, um, there's at least a basic level of communication that we have between us. Great, thank you, Ryland. Um, that is us sort of just past the time we've got. I know that a couple of other people did have questions, but I think we should move on to keep to the schedule of the day. Um, but please do um, pop a little question in the chat and somebody from the sound team will try and you know make sure you get a chance to, we can put it to Ryland or Joe if, if you want to. Uh, can I just thank both of our featured composers for their input. Um, I think it's been fascinating to me and wish you all the success in your futures. Thank you.